when people these days think of Seattle, they probably think of things like jets, software, and coffee. And these are good images, but behind them, there's another side of Seattle that's just as important, and that's its heritage as one of the world's great port cities. The Port of Seattle operates all kinds of maritime facilities, big container terminals, the fisherman's terminal, cruise ship facilities, small boat marinas. Then, of course, they run the region's largest airport. You just go down anywhere on Seattle's waterfront and you are looking at the Port of Seattle. And a lot of people, obviously, who see it every day don't think about the Port of Seattle. But when you start looking at that and you start asking yourself, where did that all come from? Why? Why is that here? The political, economic, social history of the Port of Seattle is pretty interesting. The Port of Seattle was one of the first public ports in, in North America. It was established to provide a level playing field for commerce, to avoid the negative effects of competitive shipping and railroad interests. Seattle's port is like its lung system. We breathe in and out of our port. It's what makes this city live. It's been this way from the very start. It's important for us to care about the Port of Seattle because it is such a presence in our local history. And to us right now, it, it, it's a big thing and it affects us. And it's time to celebrate 100 years of this port because it's been very helpful in a big way for the community. its first settlers arrived, that was the Denny Party back in the early 1850s, Seattle was different than a lot of uh, the new towns being settled in the American West. People came across the Oregon Trail to other places like the Willamette Valley looking for fertile land to farm and ranch. That's not why the Denny Party settled on Alki Point in what's now West Seattle. They came here to trade. And what they were looking to trade was what uh, Western Washington had in abundance, which was big trees. They initially settled on the far stretch over here called Alki Point, but found it to be too blustery, too stormy. So they borrowed an Indian canoe and they set out to check out the rest of the harbor. What they found is that along the east shore of Elliott Bay, which is now downtown Seattle, when they took a a clothesline and tied it to a horseshoe and threw it overboard, it was a long ways before it hit ground, which means you could move in ships pretty close to the shore. We now know that it was 200 or more feet deep, and uh, I'm sure they were very excited to realize that they had just discovered the best bay on the whole of Puget Sound that would one day become a fabulous international trading port. Washington Territory was first developing, railroads were the key. Every little town assumed that their particular location would be the site of the end of the transcontinental line, which would of course make that town or city center of the region. And certainly the uh, settlers of Seattle from the very beginning assumed that, that would be the case, but they got a rude awakening in July of 1873 when the Northern Pacific, the uh, railroad that was building across the country to Washington Territory, announced they would be locating in Tacoma, not in Seattle. And it seemed as though the destiny that the founders of Seattle had held in their minds, even before they had arrived here, that that destiny would be lost. As it turned out, the destiny was deferred, delayed, um, to a degree recuperated as Seattle pulled up its bootstraps and said, okay, fine, we will build our own railroad to connect to the Northern Pacific Railroad, but we will connect and we will beat Tacoma and we will be the queen city on Puget Sound. The railroad had gone to Tacoma, 
but by now there were what's known as the Mosquito Fleet. Small steamers independently owned that plied back and forth, up and down Puget Sound. And they gave Seattle its first real advantage until the 1890s when James Hill brought his Great Northern Railroad and Seattle finally had a transcontinental railroad. Just in time for the 1897 discovery of gold in Alaska, for which Seattle became the uh, jumping off place and really started to boom. When the railroads did finally arrive in Seattle, there was great joy here. But over the next few years, several more railroads arrived and all of them wanted access to our waterfront. All of them wanted to be able to roll their trains right on up to the wharves, which they also wanted to own. And the result of all of that was that you had three or four railroads, each with competing lines, as many as eight or nine railroad tracks uh, parallel to each other, crossing each other in some places. As railroad companies were charging each other fees to cross each other's lines, then it made just an unholy mess of the waterfront. And it just reached a point where neither man nor beast could safely walk down to the waterfront anymore. One of Seattle's civil engineers of the era, Virgil Bogue, completed a report in 1895 that examined the situation, and his conclusion was that it was a mess. With trains frequently passing, switching going on, and cars and trains standing on the various tracks, the present condition of the avenue is a blot on the city and menace to the lives of its people. The first decade of the 20th century was a high point for what's known as the progressive movement. Reformers pushing for reforms in a lot of areas. One of them was George Cotterell. He was part of the progressive forces in the state legislature and he introduced the first act that would have allowed the formation of public port districts. Not surprisingly, this led to bitter opposition from the railroads, dock owners, and the business establishment. Certainly, the, the, anything that involves public ownership or public influence takes on the bugaboo of socialist. So the idea of the city actually taking some control of the waterfront, managing it, was not thought proper. It was going to inhibit the enthusiasm of entrepreneurs. It was going to stop the kind of imagination that's needed to make America great. <laughs> But in fact, it was making it a mess, and so the city had to really take control of it, and they convinced the voters of that. Cotterell's first attempt at Port District legislation was actually passed by the legislature, but vetoed by the then governor in 1907, who generally went along with the business establishment. But in 1910, the railroads really overplayed their hand. Seattle had two projects going then, one to build the ship canal from Elliott Bay to Lake Washington, the other to ready the Duwamish uh, River as a waterway for the ships that would be coming through the Panama Canal. The railroads saw this as competition. They went to court and they won some court cases delaying these projects. And at that point, even the Times and PI and most of the Seattle business establishment said enough is enough. Maybe we do need to, in this one instance, embrace public ownership. The voters of King County are to vote in favor of the proposition to create the Port of Seattle. As a fact, there is no more important work to be done in this city. We must enter upon a comprehensive plan of harbor improvement. In March of 1911, the Port District Act was passed and the people in King County lost no time. On September 5th, 1911, King County voters approved a countywide Port of Seattle, and that was the beginning of the uh, Port of Seattle's 100-year history. When the Port of Seattle was initially formed, the first trio of men who served as port commissioners were a very interesting bunch. One of them was Robert Bridges. He was a radical, hard-knuckled, former coal miner, and throughout his entire career here, he was always very sympathetic to labor's needs and wants, and he served proudly for many years. 
Hiram Chittenden was probably the best known and most popular. He was a retired Army Corps of Engineer officer who had made himself popular in Seattle by getting the ship canal built. The uh, Chittenden locks on the ship canal are named for him. And then the third one, supposed to balance bridges, was a banker and attorney from Fremont by the name of C.E. Remsburg, but it turned out that he was just as radical as Bridges and Chittenden. Very soon after the Port of Seattle was formed, the commissioners launched a very aggressive agenda, very ambitious really. They uh, had in mind establishing numerous facilities along the waterfront that would ultimately end up being a robust array of facilities and amenities for maritime commerce. The first one was Fisherman's Terminal on Salmon Bay. In my family, we had a series of photographs that were handed down from my grandfather. Particularly there was one photograph of a group, I think of about 10 men. They call themselves the Puget Sound Purse Seine Fishermen's Association. My grandfather was in this picture and I wondered who they were. And I learned that this group of fishermen had lobbied the Port of Seattle to create a home port for the fishing fleet of the North Pacific. It turned out these photographs were of a specific day in Seattle history, and it was January 10th, 1914. It was a cold, wintry Saturday afternoon, and there were about 2,000 people down here celebrating. It was the opening day, official celebration of the opening of Fisherman's Terminal. There was a parade that came through uh, Salmon Bay, from Puget Sound into Salmon Bay, a parade of boats. There was 150 of the Seattle fleet and about 50 boats from Tacoma came up. There were flags flying, there were bands, and I learned that my grandfather's boat, the Inga, was leading this parade. Fisherman's Terminal is a place that a community calls home. It is the winter port for a majority of the fleet that fishes in Alaska, and it's just a big support group um, all here for, for the fishing industry. The memorial is at the center of Fisherman's Terminal. That's the only place where there's closure for quite a few families who have lost loved ones at sea. The fishermen and the Port of Seattle really support the memorial, and it's very important. Another of the Port of Seattle's early facilities was Smith Cove, and that was initially discovered by Dr. Smith, who arrived in Seattle way back in 1853. He liked that location. He saw that it was a nice saltwater cove. It was also perfectly aligned to be the eventual terminus of a transcontinental railroad. It became very important to Seattle's economy because it was the site of shipping silk and soybean oil and products like that that were very lucrative. In more modern times, it has become the site of some of the world's longest and best piers and some of the Northwest cruise ship lines. Eastern Washington has always been part of America's image as the breadbasket of the world. Prior to 1914, however, Eastern Washington grain was being barged the long route down the Columbia River into Portland. Well, the port, founded in 1911, three years later builds a grain terminal at Hanford Street, and suddenly the Eastern Washington grain starts coming over the mountains by rail to Seattle and shipped out from Seattle all around the Pacific Rim. In 1970, the Port of Seattle built a new grain terminal at the foot of Queen Anne Hill. In 79, that location became a point of, of enduring significance for us when the first cargo ship from mainland China since the Korean War docked here to pick up grain. One of our oldest trading partners had come back and that relationship has continued and expanded ever since. They also built a cold storage facility. They actually built two, one for fruit for farmers in the area and the other one for the fishermen. And the reason they did that is not because there weren't any, there were private cold storage facilities, but the price was too high for most fishermen. And they built the Bell Street Pier as a general purpose pier to serve the Mosquito Fleet. 
they put their headquarters there, and on the roof of the headquarters, they stuck a park. Uh, they called it Happy Land. It was supposed to be a place that kids could uh, play while their parents shopped at Pike Place Market. But the name took on a new meaning when it turned out that a lot of sailors on leave with the uh, dates they picked up on the streets were getting perhaps a little too happy up there and they had to close the thing down after a few years. In the beginning, a public port was a risky venture. No one had tried this anywhere in the country at this scale, at this level. And there are a lot of skeptics and critics. But after 10 years, people started to see our success. Silk from the Asian trade arriving in Seattle at Smith Cove became such a hot commodity that railroads built special locomotives and ran high-speed trains with armed guards to rush the silk across the nation from Seattle. Bill Boeing started the nation's first airmail service using a seaplane so he could rush ships manifest down from Victoria to alert Seattle merchants about the cargoes heading this way. The attacks and controversy on the port didn't last much beyond the start of World War I because the huge boost in trade on the Pacific that the war generated soon proved that the early commissioners were right in the facilities that they built. They were able to handle bigger ships and more quickly than other ports, and Seattle trade boomed. The experiment was a success. In 1918, Seattle was the second busiest port to New York City in all of the nation. So all over the nation, people followed our model, and our success was replicated around the country. This boom went on through the end of the 1920s, when, of course, we moved into the darkness of the Depression. The Great Depression hit Seattle very hard. Seattle had a huge Hooverville set up on Port of Seattle property at the old Skinner and Eddy shipyard site, not far from where Quest Field is today. And throughout the 30s, upwards of a thousand men in self-built shacks lived in what actually became a viable little community with a mayor and a council, but it, it was a, a, a mark of how desperate things had become in this city in the 1930s. The 1934 Longshore Strike was one of the most dramatic and important struggles of the whole Great Depression era, and all of the ports from San Diego to Seattle shut down. Smith Cove became the site for some of the more dramatic moments in the strike. And for two days, pitched battles were fought between police armed with tear gas, clubs, strikers, picket signs, and also rocks, battling under this bridge here behind us. One striker was killed by a tear gas grenade that hit him in the head and many were injured. The longshore workers and sailors lost the Battle of Smith Cove, but they won the strike. The very next day, up and down the coast, shippers agreed to binding arbitration with the Union. And by July 31, the great strike of 1934 was over. The Union had won. The strike certainly helped make the port of Seattle and the other ports the prosperous and efficient institutions that they are today. Because that union established a very strong and ultimately very stable relationship with employers, almost 70 years of peace, more or less, on the docks. So the shippers who thought they lost the 1934 strike were wrong. They won, the workers won, Seattle won. As is so often the case, a war put an end to the economic uh, hardships. By 1940, the economy was picking up, and the port was able to raise the remaining bits of Louverville. 
and the U.S. military pretty much took over most of the port facilities. They kept them real busy. Soldiers embarked, war supplies went over the docks, and a great deal of shipbuilding going on all along the waterfront. Three ships per day being churned out at the height of the war. Besides taking over the harbor, the military was commandeering all the airports in the region for military uses, and leaders wanted a new airport for civilian use. We've got to remember that before World War II, Boeing Field was Seattle's airport. And during the war, Boeing Field was extremely busy with the construction of the B-17s there. It became obvious that they needed a commercial airport real bad. And that's where the Port of Seattle jumped into action here and made all this happen. And I remember when they first moved out here, United and Western had little Quonset huts right down here. One of them heated by an old pot-bellied stove there in the middle of the room. They got to stoke it with coal. And then gradually they continued to build and finish this terminal, which was finished in 49. The uh, opening day here at SeaTac, it was a huge gala event here. Everybody was out on the ramp and planes coming over and the loudspeaker was announcing the ribbon cutting and all that stuff. Just a great festive occasion. From then on, there was no way but up. The air traffic kept booming and growing. And uh, I, as a citizen, am very proud of the part that the Port of Seattle has played in this. They've aggressively pursued the, the airport here. When SeaTac Airport opened in 1949, air travel was still relatively new and exciting for most people. So they dressed to the nines when they traveled. SeaTac catered to this new generation of jet setters with elegant amenities, including jazz in the terminal swanky dining room. As the Century 21 Exposition, which was Seattle's World's Fair of 1962, approached, SeaTac got ready for the big influx of visitors by expanding the runway, actually for the third time since the airport had opened. Two more runways and many, many facilities followed in coming decades. SeaTac today is a busy, bustling airport, and it's a huge economic engine for this region. It generates nearly 90,000 direct jobs. The revenues from SeaTac actually surpass all of the other operations of the Port of Seattle. So the enthusiasm that Seattleites showed when they came out to the airport for opening day in 1949 has certainly been justified many times over. Along with managing for growth, SeaTac was among the first to look at its properties and its operations with a particular emphasis on the environment. In 1971, for example, the port was the first to create a staff position focused entirely on ecological considerations. To look at wildlife hazards, to make sure the large birds were not attracted to the airport. SeaTac is also considered a leader in developing innovative, award-winning programs to protect air and water quality, and it's these accomplishments that make me extremely proud to be working with the Port of Seattle. SeaTac grew through the 50s. The seaport did not. It stagnated. And by the end of the decade, there were multiple studies. Seattle is in a bad way, trying to operate in 1959 with a sailing ship port. There was a documentary on TV called Lost Cargo. Everybody pretty much thought a new approach was needed. In the mid-1960s, when I joined the port, basically everything was break bulk which was cartons of containers that were loaded individually on ships. When a vessel came into Seattle, Longshoremen would go into the vessel and load those cartons on cargo boards and hoist them out uh, one cargo board at a time. So a typical ship would be in for six or seven days discharging, and following the discharge, it was three or four days sorting cargo before any cargo was picked up for delivery. So people looked for another way to handle this business. You couldn't handle the cargo as fast as you needed to, so people started to look for new ways to do that. 
people said, if we can take all those individual pieces, put them in one large box, move that one large box, then we're going to save a lot of time. So Alaska Steamship Line started to look at how to palletize and containerize. They were one of the first leaders in this area. It became apparent pretty quickly that this was a successful way. This was where the future was going with containers. Seattle took a lot of risks to begin with and started a massive investment program, probably more than a billion dollars over the course of 20 years, developing facilities with docks that were strong enough to be able to put cranes on there that could lift these containers. We rapidly became the leader in container transportation on the entire West Coast. Containerization really started transforming the port into what we see today. It moved shipping away from the old gold rush docks, which the port then helped redevelop as an attractive urban waterfront. They even created a new version of the Happy Land on the roof of the Bell Street facility. Meanwhile, the airport kept expanding, cargo facilities kept expanding, the port built new marinas, and they built new cruise ship terminals. By the year 2000, the mid 20th century slump was a distant memory. I think if the voters of 1911, the ones who voted yes, could look at the port today and see what they'd set in motion, they'd be absolutely amazed. The success of the 1911 proposal, which became the port of Seattle, proved a lot of things. It proved that people can really work together and that the public and the private sectors can work together. They can make a more efficient port, they can make it run smoother and make it of greater benefit to the citizens. In 2011, as the port looks forward into the future, we're emphasizing environmental sustainability. Environmental restoration, environmental cleanup, parks such as we are enjoying just now, and environmental conditions in the aquatic area, in the Duwamish River, and in Elliott Bay, are utterly important to the port's future. In the Duwamish Waterway, we have treaty fishing activities. We work on a yearly basis with the Muckleshoot Indian Tribe and the Suquamish Indian Tribe to ensure that harvest of migratory fish, salmon, can take place in our industrial waterway. The port, in the last 20 years, has developed nearly 25 acres of public open space. Nearly five miles of linear access to the water. Shorelines like this that offer the opportunity for people to touch the water, to enjoy this landscape in the midst of industrial development demonstrate that these are activities that can be and are mutually beneficial. Well, the port touches people, I think, in many ways that uh, they don't realize. Why they can get fruit when it's out of season in the Yakima, why they can get cut flowers when we're in the middle of winter here. The port uh, is our connections to the world, both with the marine port and the airport, uh, and that certainly uh, has enhanced us becoming a, a world-class city. Seattle feels to me like it's on the edge. When you're on the edge, you either fly or you fail. It's on the edge of the continent, it's on the edge of the land, it's on the edge of the 21st century, and there's a kind of edginess and a kind of excitement to this place as a maritime city that just looking at the harbor always brings tears to my eyes. It's, it's a kind of magic that I never saw um, growing up in my little town, which had no exposure to that kind of highway that goes all over the world. You can take a sailboat from the edge of Pike Street and sail anywhere on the planet. We're on the edge. That's what's exciting about being in a maritime city.